All right, so here is the wrap up of chapter one's lecture. So think about what we talked about in class when we we're going over the basic ideas of environmental science, the different disciplines associated with it, the way we need to work cross-disciplinary. We discussed in class, you have to be able to talk to the scientists, but also sociologists, political scientists, um, art, humanities, etc., to really be effective in this field. So that, that's a big thing I want you guys to remember. There's a spectrum of disciplines that all come together in the environmental science field. Also, definitely be comfortable with the history of environmental science, um, how we moved from that utilitarian into the different types of environmental science and we're currently in that modern environmental science type of movement as people would refer to it. But what does it really mean? And what are the concepts behind each of those? Also tie in those key people. And we talked about Roosevelt, Pinchot, Leopold, Aldo Leopold, Rachel Carson, and those other people. How do they contribute to those movements? And then again, you guys have that lab assignment. Come up with somebody who's working with the modern environmental science movement. How are they helping shape modern environmental science? They may be an unbelievably great mentor or role model for those of you interested in pursuing this field. So get, get familiar with somebody that you're interested in when you're doing that. So we left off in class talking about sustainable development and those core concepts. Um, so just reiterating, refreshing, and reminding everybody, uh, when we look at core concepts of environmental science and sustainable development, we want to look at ecosystem services. What does an ecosystem provide for us? Medicine, food, natural resources, etc. Are the resources shared and are the services provided by ecosystems shared? And then we really, if possible, if they're available, there we go, sorry. If they're available, can we work with indigenous populations? Because these folks have been protecting, preserving biodiversity for their entire existence as a culture. So Native Americans, different Native American groups across the world, whether it's North America, Canada, Alaska, Central South America, Australia, etc. Those people understand the land. That information has been passed down through generation after generation after generation. So if possible, definitely work with indigenous populations because they understand better than anybody else how to live in harmony with the land and how to be sustainable because been doing it for the existence of their societies. So once we get these ideas together with sustainable development, we want to look at a thing called tragedy of the commons. Okay, so tragedy of the commons. Let me start this little video link and we'll check that out. All right, so little minute, one minute, minute and a half video. Just watch for a second. For a minute and a half here.
Okay, so what we saw in that little video is there's a huge challenge when we have what we call the commons, resources shared by all. No one controls it, no one owns it. If there are no rules, laws, regulations to protect it, unfortunately human nature sometimes says take all you can because if you don't somebody else will. And as we saw with the little cow video or the cow cartoon, people abuse the land, destroyed it, now everybody loses. So it's a very, very difficult thing to restrain yourselves. Can that farmer restrain himself or herself and say, all right, I'm not going to destroy the commons because I want it to be there for the next generation. That's the whole idea of sustainability that we discussed in class. But they run into that problem. Well, if I only put two cows, my neighbor might put six cows on here. Why should they make more money than me? So this is where we have to have rules and regulations and laws and things like that to be able to manage what we call the commons. If it's private property, whole different ball game. Owner, to a certain extent, does whatever they want, makes their own decisions based on their own view of environmental science. You know, are they utilitarian? Are they a wilderness preservation? What is their personal view? No right or wrong if they own the property. But when it's a commons, it's much more challenging. So think about things like fish in the ocean. Nobody owns the ocean. You know, countries own territorial waters along their coastline, but those fish swim out of those waters and they're fair game for anybody in the world. So there are ways to manage the commons, and we learn this the hard way. So the Northwest Atlantic cod population, we basically decimated it. Humans nearly wiped them off the face of the earth in the early 2000s because we overfished because of the tragedy of the commons. All right, let's catch them, catch them, catch them, catch them. And we were catching fish that we shouldn't. We kept fish that should have been released. We were not allowing them to breed and reproduce. And we collapsed the cod industry in the early 2000s. It hit basically bottomed out. It's slowly, very, very slowly starting to recover, if it ever will. So, depends. There's a lot of possibilities, a lot of hope for it to recover, but you push a species too far down, crash that population, and you may have doomed it to extinction. So, to manage the commons, it is possible. It is totally possible. And we have lots of really good stories where we've done this. Um, what we have to figure out are effective and inexpensive monitoring of resource use, Oops, resource use methods. So how can we keep track of how many fish are being caught, how many of these are being harvested, how many of this is being taken out of the commons. So you got to find a way to do it. This is where technology really steps into the picture and helps us. So if any of you are deer hunters or friends, family, you know people who are, you kill a deer this hunting season, all you have to do is call it in. You don't have to drive anywhere with it anymore. You don't have to take it to a specific site or location. You just simply get on your phone touch tone, dial it in, and everything's doot, 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 doot. okay. One if it's this, two if it's that. You don't have to talk to anybody. Very convenient, very easy, very inexpensive. All the data gets aggregated and it helps DNR decide how many deer to be harvested the next season. We're managing that common resource that way. So it's become very, very, very successful in helping manage it. Um, number two, is difficult. Can you exclude those who don't follow the rules? Depending on is this a species that is common to a state or to a country or to the world, you may or may not be able to enforce this. But let's go back to our deer example. Somebody's caught poaching. Somebody's killing deer when they shouldn't or killing too many deer that they don't have permission or permits for. You lose your hunting privileges. We have laws that 
exclude those people who are not following the rules. Laws that reward those who do follow the rules. So it's a reward system to say, follow the rules for the benefit of all, and those deer will continue to be there. Cat industry, we didn't have rules in place. Those fish are gone. Maybe they'll recover, but it's going to take years. But if you guys watch the show The Deadliest Catch, those crab fishermen, think about when they're catching those fish or crabs, they're measuring them. And they're saying, okay, we can only collect so many. We got to kick back the females, the little ones. Let's keep the big ones. And then we can only harvest so many crab in a given season. If you over harvest, then you face fines and penalties and possibly lose your fishing privileges. Okay, third one. All right, so to help really effectively manage, we need to have these frequent face-to-face -face communication and strong social networking. Get the public on board. Get them supporting this concept and this idea. And whoever's running the management of the commons needs to be accessible to the public. So if I'm a hunter and I'm frustrated, I don't want to email somebody. I don't want to deal with it in a non-social um, environment. I don't want to sit at my computer and get an answer back the next day through an email or a blog post. You need to talk to people face-to-face. -face. You can resolve things so much faster face-to-face -face if there's a, a concern or a disgruntled issue. If you're trying to build support, call it, make that town hall meeting, set it up, come on in. We've got a meeting on the 20th of the month, this day, that day. Give people the opportunity because when you have face-to-face -face communication, there's a lot stronger of a bond that is created with a person you've been working with and you actually know who they are and you've met them in person. Social uh, networking is great. Online communication can do great things, but it's not the same as sitting down face-to-face. -face. So there's always that suggestion, recommendation, do as much of it as possible. And it's not realistic to think every single day you're going to meet with people and work with these issues. But the more of it you can do, it makes a huge difference. So if you're writing a proposal about a conservation plan or restoration work, meet with the person in person. Give them some time, some face time, some energy and say, look, this is what we're proposing. Let me go work on it. I'll bounce it to you in an email once I got it together, <clears throat> but you build a much stronger relationship in a face-to-face -face environment with things like this than we can just through emails and, and Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat, things like that. So we want to keep these ideas in mind of how to manage the commons because there's lots of commons out there that we want to preserve for the good of our community, our state, our country, and our world. So, all right, so now the last thing to mention, when we look at this environmental issue, we often look at morality and where do we all fall in this picture. This is a personal decision for all of us. What do we think is moral? What is right? Should we be able to do this or that? Respect people's views. I would definitely ask and encourage you to do that. Respect people's views. You may not agree, and that's okay. Explain it, though. Don't come at it from a personal attack, but come at it from a, here's why we might want to change this. This is why it would be better in the long term and how it would benefit you and other people. But you think about moral considerations. We start with ourselves. Then we look at our parents, what's our family influence, what's the influence of humanity. Uh, we get these things we call sentiment animals, and we'll talk more about those with our restoration plan. Then we look at all life, and what is our value, how do we value the entire planet. So things we want to think about, these ideas here about moral considerations, will come back when we're looking at developing restoration plans and how we place value on things. All right, so this wraps up chapter one, or 
our first chapter here. We got that done. Um, make sure you guys are jumping on some of the other online.